Well, this is going to be a fun list, actually. I'm excited. I'm quite excited with yep. this. It's good stuff. Um, <laughs> elephant in the room. We ain't talking about the top 10 games on board game again. Oh, no. <laughs> Gotta go a lot deeper than that. <laughs> What's happening, party people? Welcome to Punchboard Party. My name is Daniel. This is Father Greg, and we got a doozy for you guys. We decided tonight to talk about our top 10 underrated board games. We're talking hidden gems quality here. So we decided. I texted Father Greg. I was like, Hey, can, can you come up with a list of top 10 games under a thousand on Board Game Geek? That's kind of my like arbitrary line mm -hmm. for when they become hidden gems really i mean whatever what else did you kind of consider for this list or how did you how did you put it together yeah i looked at all the games i had and i went below a thousand <laughs> <laughs> and then you picked your favorite <laughs> that's right i started picking 10 games that i really like so yeah so all of these games i i rate an eight or higher these are these okay. are all good solid games that i i really enjoy I might have a couple on my list that I rate a seven, mm -hmm. but like all very favorable for me. All games for that sure. I would play almost in a heartbeat. Like these are like mm -hmm. real go-to games for me. Yeah, I was surprised by how low some of these games were. Right. For right, sure. Right, right. It's gonna it's gonna be fun to talk about. We've also decided to talk about these games, uh, starting with so the first game we talk about will be like closest to a thousand, mm -hmm. and then they're gonna get more hidden as we go down the list. So that's the last right. game we talk about is going to be a real hidden beauty. That's right. Nobody's so ever heard of this game. And so the hope is, party people, is that it's going to give you just more games to pique your interest, more games for you to uh, sink your teeth into yourself. I'm also going to tell you why Board Game Geek is a moron. These <laughs> games are gold. These games should be in the top 10. What is wrong with people putting these games at 3,000? Yeah, like, <laughs> I, I would prefer playing probably most of these games above the majority of the top 10 on Board Game right. Geek. That's the beautiful thing about being a board gamer. That's right. Is that we all have our preferences, we all have our comfort food. Food and board games. Mm -hmm. So without any further ado, party people, top 10 underrated board games, hidden gems. So my uh, my first hidden gem is just 33 off of the top 1,000. So 1,033. 1,033, yeah. Uh, and that's Automania. Oh, cool. So Automania, I saw that. I was like, wow, that's below the top 1,000. Man, that shouldn't be. That's crazy. Automania is, uh, yeah, just a game about making cars. And, and the lovely thing is on your first turn, you can make a car. There's no reason. <laughs> There's nothing to stop you from making a car on your first turn. You run the conveyor belt. It's not a great car. It's like, it's a car. It's got wheels. It moves. Right. Is it fuel efficient? No. Is it comfortable? No. Is it fast? No. But you can sell it, you know? <laughs> and, and over time, your cars get better and better. People start demanding different things. They want a car that's got good handling or they want a car with lots of trunk space or something like that but you start selling cars to north america want something different than europe does and uh but yeah it's just a, a great little kind of worker placement euro game love it automate nice nice my big regret is early on you would bring board games over to my house mm. when i have game days but i always had stuff that i wanted to get played so i would just play my stuff and so you just stopped bringing stuff That's over right. to my house but one time you brought all mania and i regret not Playing Automania. Okay, my number 10. This is Brian Baru, High King of Ireland. So this game is fairly new. It mm -hmm. might sneak up uh, above the bottom thousand here. Like it might it might actually get up right. there. Because uh, it's fairly new, but at the same time, it's a good chance it might have plateaued. I I've started to hear some people talk about it a bit more, but it kind of came. Had a nice little moderate splash where people were like, this is pretty good. I think it's excellent. Mm -hmm. And then it just sort of... Went out of print really quickly, and then came back in stock, and so we'll see where it goes. But <laughs> this is a trick-taking area control game. So I've really started getting into trick-taking. I got into this game before I got really into trick-taking. Right. But this is kind of neat. It has that trick-taking vibe, although probably more action selection is kind of what you would call it. Because mm -hmm. you're kind of like playing a card. You get a really good thing if you play the right card at the right time. But you'll still always get something. But then you're just going after majorities and there's these three other kind of majority track type things that you're working out around the board and really simple, streamlined, clean game where the core of the game is in that hand of cards that you're playing. And I always love that about games. So Brian Baru, if you haven't checked it out, check it out. It's excellent. Yeah, this game should get into the top thousand for sure. Yes. Like this is a, this is a good, good game. 
for sure. Well, in my uh, top 10 games of all time, I, I placed my next one, which was 10,070 uh, on the on the board game list, and that's Watson and Holmes. And wow, when I okay. mentioned yeah, this yeah, game, yeah. you were like, I've never heard of I've it. I've never heard of it. And I was like, it's awesome. <laughs> Man, you should play it. And yeah, see? He's never heard of it. Uh, so yeah, Watson and Holmes is like a, a, a lot of like deduction games tend to be like a lot of the Sherlock Holmes consulting detective games are cooperative. This one's competitive. You're you're racing to finish the mystery. I said in the top ten that I what I like about it is that the mysteries are solvable. There there's a clear answer, and if you get enough clues, you can almost certainly figure out who done it. So it's just a matter of kind of getting there before your friends. There's a little bit of like kind of bluffing. You can go to a spot and realize it's really good. And then like you can like put the police on that spot. So like other people can't get there uh, at least for a little while. But you can like bluff. You can go to a really bad spot and put the police on there. Okay. Just so everyone thinks that like they need to rush over to that spot. Big red herring. <laughs> but uh, yeah, no. So love Watson and Holmes. That's awesome. So I was putting images together when you talked about this in your top mm. uh, 10. I was like, oh, this looks kind of neat. When you were talking about it, I had no flipping idea. Idea right, what you were talking about, but yeah, it, look, it looks kind of neat. I don't love deduction games, so right. I don't know how much I would actually enjoy it. But uh, <laughs> good idea, man. A hidden gem for sure. Yeah, for not sure. not top ten material. <laughs> what, the, what the heck? No, nah, man. Heck? This is so good. <laughs> okay, this next game. It's a new find for me. This game I got into my buddy's car when I was in Halifax, and he had a copy of this in shrink. And I was like, "What's this? I've never heard of it." And I was looking. I was like, "It looks great." And he was like, "Ah, I'm selling it. It's out of print. Uh, I bought it a while ago." Uh, but I'm not playing it, so I'm gonna get rid of it. I was like, oh, well, there goes trying that. I checked the Kijiji here in Saskatoon while I was away, and there was a copy of it in shrink for sale. And so I picked it up. This is Strasbourg by Stefan Feld. Wow. This game has skyrocketed. Like, when we do, when we do our top 100 again, <laughs> this game is amazing. So this is coming in at 11.29. Hmm. On Board Game Geek. It was nominated for the Kenner Spiel in 2011. Hmm. If my research is correct, it got beat out by uh, Seven Wonders that year. Wow. So like wow. stiff competition yeah, yeah. it had. But this this is excellent. This is an auction game. So you got five rounds. And each round you have seven auctions. And the auctions alternate. So there's a guild auction, which corresponds to uh, a tile on this on this kind of main board, there's all these kind of guild sections, and there's a blue section of tile, of, not tiles, but like of squares. There's a red section of squares, there's a yellow squ section of squares, they all correspond to different guilds, and they're all different costs to put your family members out on these spaces. But when you uh, go for an auction, it's this really crazy thing. You have 24 cards to last you the entire game. So it'll last you five rounds. At the beginning of a round, you can draw up as many cards as you want. And then you take those cards that you drew up and you put them into stacks, they're called. So just little, you know, you might have a stack of one card, you might have a stack of two cards or three cards, and you make your stacks face down. And then when it's time to start going through the auctions, you just say, okay, first auction, and then starting with the first player, they're either gonna flip a stack or pass. And you have one shot at each auction. And so you get to choose kind of what stack you're gonna put, or if you're gonna put uh, a stack in at all. But you kinda, you set up your play for the seven auctions at the beginning of the round, and then you just kinda use that to your best advantage. With five players, the tension, and the double guessing, and the bluffing, and this is fun, this is quirky, this is amazing. Strasbourg can't recommend it highly enough. Wouldn't it be funny if it was that game from Halifax that you ended up buying off the <laughs> That would be funny. It, was, it wasn't. It wasn't. But that'd be funny. My number eight is a crossover. It's Brian Baru. <laughs> <laughs> so. Already, maybe? Was that the yeah. one that you were predicting? Yes, one okay. of them for sure. Yep. Okay. Yep. So, Wait. yeah, Brian Baru, everything he said, it's really good. <laughs> it, it all, I, I, I have to think this will be in the top one. Yeah, because it's 11.20 right now. Mm -hmm. I, I just heard about it on a board game podcast. I can't remember which one it was, but there was uh, some guys talking about it. And I was like, oh, okay. It's, it's just getting back into people's hands. Mm -hmm. So, yeah, I, I think. And after this, after we talk about it. That's right. Oh, yeah. <laughs> it's going to be right up there. A hundred more views straight up to the top. <laughs> All right, so my number eight is coming in at 11.42 currently on Board Game Geek, and this is Conspiracy, Abyss Universe. So this is what? like Abyss Light. This is a little card game, card game version of Abyss. Okay. And yes, you might say, isn't Abyss a card game? <laughs> then you'd be right. 
<laughs> so but there's a big bar to Abyss. Yeah, yes. yeah, 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 yeah. So this is neat. It kind of shares the same sort of drafting mechanism mm -hmm. that Abyss had, where you have the cards kind of coming along the top row, and you don't necessarily get to choose first out right. of what's coming down. But then what you're doing with those cards is you're kind of creating this tableau in front of you. And what you're going to do, you're going to kind of get uh, points for your biggest chunks of colors. So you're trying to keep the same colors connected. So the keys also come into play, and they give you like bonuses and different things if you kind of connect keys in your like row I, don't, I can't remember exactly how that works mm -hmm. but it's a nice simple game that really does give me like abyss vibes without much of the bigger portions of abyss now i love abyss mm -hmm. i love abyss more than this but this definitely scratches a similar itch and just a short little playtime. so uh, i think the, my next game is at 11.73 and uh this game i it was definitely in my top 10 i think it might even have been higher than watson and holmes and that is Royals. Uh, oh, when man. I saw Royals at 11.73, I was like, that's crazy, man. That's pretty criminal, actually. Like, I was like, this is insane. Like, Ticket to Ride is like, it's maybe in the top 100. It's in the top 100. Yeah. It's yeah. like somewhere. And I'm like, for me, it's just like Ticket to Ride, slightly more gamery version. Yes. This is like, this is what I, I bring Ticket to Ride out to new people. I teach them that. And then I'm like, okay. Now we're going to play a game that does the exact same thing as Ticket to Ride, but just with a little bit extra. And we play Royals, and it's yeah. a great little one-two punch. I, I really enjoy Royals. Uh, I actually just played a game of it last night. Okay. And, uh, yeah, went over, went over like, Dynamite. Well, re really great for us with area control being one of the things that we just love mm -hmm. so much. And then having that searching for the right color cards to try and get majorities in certain areas. It's a great right. combination of things. Mm -hmm. Yeah, when, when I when I saw that too, I was like, what is this? Mm -hmm. It must have just, yeah, just kind of came and went. And I mean, that's why in our top 10, Board Game Geek had told me this was my most overrated game. Yes. This was the game yes. that I uh, had the greatest disparity in rankings between. But we're saying no. That's right. You're not overrating it. They've no. underrated it. That's right. That's right. Yep. For sure. <laughs> this might be a crossover for us. This is coming mm. in at 1274. This is Asara. Mm. So Asara is a Kramer and Kiesling classic. It wasn't on my top 100 board games because I had forgotten to input it in my <laughs> board game geek rankings. But then as I was doing this list, I was like, oh man, if you can get a hold of Asara, this is so good. There's a board full of different locations that have these tower pieces. And essentially, you're just trying to build different colored towers of different heights to get majorities and points and these kinds of things. But essentially, all the locations are the same. You can, you can play any card to any of the locations at the beginning of the game. But then once one person places a particular color at one of those locations, then you have to play that color of card onto that location to purchase from that location. So good. So mm -hmm. good. Because you're playing and everything's just wide open. And then mm -hmm. it just starts to... Just close on in on you, and you're you're playing. You're trying to play as strategically as possible, to according to your hand to make sure that you can capitalize on getting the P tower pieces that you really need. Mm -hmm. I just think this is really good for sure. I, I'm glad you mentioned it because it was just off of my list. Oh, so just uh, off. Okay, it didn't make my list, but you're right. the The idea of having this hand of cards, and yeah, you first you can put any you can go anywhere you want, but. Yeah. After somebody puts green in a certain spot, now you got to play green if you want to go there. Yeah. Um, and that just, yeah, as you say, it narrows it down. And, and, and just the, like, area control, like, you want the most green tower, or the highest green tower. But then you also want, like, the most towers. Yeah. So, like, sometimes you want a really big tower. Sometimes you want lots of, like, little towers. Yeah. Uh, yeah, nice little... Tension, tension everywhere. Mm -hmm. Tension everywhere. It's really good. My number six may be a, a crossover as well. Uh, and that's coming in at 1280, and that is Codex Naturalis. Okay. Uh, another tin game. Yes, baby. <laughs> Tins uh, are to play! <laughs> tin, 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 tin. <laughs> tin, 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 tin. <laughs> so, yeah, so Codex Naturalis, you've got all these cards. They're beautiful. they got, like, gold, like, uh, on them, like, gold, I don't know, whatever you call it, like, painted on them. Foil. I don't foil. Know, foil, yeah. yeah. Um, gilding <laughs> that's right gilding sure that's a good word uh and uh, and basically you're like laying them out in this kind of weird thing where you're kind of like lining up their corners or overlapping corners and in each corner that you overlap you get like certain bonuses if like symbols match or you sometimes you cover up a symbol to place a card on but that other symbol that other card probably has 
you know, more symbols on it. And so over time, you're getting like more and more symbols and each symbol allows you to buy better cards and, and like better sort of like end game scoring abilities and things like that. Just a really neat kind of like tableau sort of yeah. building game. Uh, it's more like a puzzle. Like it's yeah, kind yeah, of yeah, like yeah, you're yeah, trying yeah. to put all these little cards together. It's But the cards are beautiful. Yes. It's got like just a... A kind of vague, but kind of a naturey theme. Mm -hmm. uh, there's like wildlife and fungi, and I yeah. don't know. Yeah, but yeah, really, really love Codex Naturalis. Yeah, this game is amazing, and my number six. Nice. <laughs> so exact crossover. This right could on. be the dropkick moment. That's good. <laughs> All right. <laughs> oh no! No, no I got <laughs> Oh gosh! I hope that looked like you were dropkick. <laughs> No, I'm probably good. just a, just a sweet chin music. That's all that Tune was. it up the bell. <laughs> He's turning on the bell. <laughs> but no, so so again, everything you said about it, yes, for sure. Also, this game is weird as sin. Like mm. it is super weird and takes up so much table space as you're like laying these cards over each mm. other because you're also there's kind of some common scoring cards. That have you making like diagonal lines and things right. like this. So you're, you're sprawling all over the place with this. Mm -hmm. And and there's some really cool stuff where some of the corners are blank. And so when you cover them up, you're not covering up a symbol. And some of the symbols are on the middle of the card. So you don't cover them mm -hmm. up. And some of the symbols are on the corners. And so it's like cards that have symbols on the corners are pretty good cards. They have points on them and mm -hmm. stuff. But you're only going to be using them for a limited time for their symbols. And you're also going for majorities of certain symbols. So it's like this push and pull right. the whole time. Great. My number five uh, coming in at 1448 is Skull Hollow. Okay. Uh, so I talked about this in my top Sweet. 100. But yeah, a little two-player uh, combat game. Uh, one player pays a bunch of little foxes. The other one plays this big octopus or raptor or whatever and yes you're just trying to like the big guy starts off being so powerful and the little guys think like how am i ever going to beat this guy but over time as time goes on they crawl on him they they bite off his arm they you know he can't throw anything anymore they, they hurt his leg and now he can't stomp them and and so like over time the foxes get just like a little bit stronger a little bit stronger and the boss gets a little bit weaker a little bit weaker so it's really nice sort of tension as to sort of like who's going to win. Uh, and uh, yeah, there's a sequel to this, Small Peak, coming out, I think, fairly, okay. fairly soon. So excited to, to give that one a try as well. But yeah, Skull Callow. That's cool. This looks like a two-player game that has a lot going on, mm -hmm. which is kind of nice. It's it is, yeah. Two-player games have a bit more girth to them. Okay, number five for me. It's coming in at uh, 14, 15 on Board Game Geek. And I've talked about this... Ad nauseum, this is Kashgar, Merchants of the Silk Road. Y'all knew it was coming. I knew this one would be on your list. As <laughs> soon as I saw it, I was like, that's a Daniel pick. For sure. <laughs> I just I just love this game. I was listening to Secret Cabal Gaming Podcast today, and they were talking about replayability in games. Mm. And they were talking about all sorts of different factors that make games replayable. But then at the end, they talked about just experience. And this could be summed up by all sorts of different things. And just kind of how you feel when playing the game. And for me, my favorite experience is just that feeling of laying down cards that combo together in some sort of way to then give me a resource so that I can go and get something else. <laughs> and you know, mm -hmm. that kind of engine building, that sort of thing. And this does that for me. And I, 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 I this is just unique. Unique. I would say a deconstructed deck builder where you have these three rows kind of solitaire style. And when you play a card, you put it to the back of the row, and then you activate the cards kind of at the top of the rows and then tuck them back in. So they're just cycling through. And all you're doing is just like, you have a board with a bunch of resources, different spices and some donkeys, and you're just collecting these resources until you can then activate a uh, contract. Like you have to actually spend a card, like use a card that gets you to kind of fulfill a contract. Do you really enjoy this game? You don't. <laughs> right. No, I I enjoyed our second play of it more than I enjoyed uh, my first play of it. But yeah, I think it's that tension between like, like yeah, do I want to put all these cards? Which row do I want to put this card in? Do I want to put it in this one row that's already got eight cards, that yeah. but that kind of has like a nice flow to it? Do I want to put it in this row where there's only three cards, so it's going to come up all the time? Right. Um, but 
I don't ever want to use that row. It's just a weird column that like it's I don't know what it's doing there. Yeah, it's interesting game. Definitely, yeah. definitely a little bit on the on the hidden gem side for sure. <laughs> for sure, definitely. and that's why it's here, baby. <laughs> My number four too. This is when. When you said hidden gems, I was like, okay, it's got to be this game. This is this is for me like a game that that I love. It's rated 1527, but like I have not heard anybody talk about this game ever. Uh, except for maybe Z once like 10 years ago. Uh, and that game is Otis. O T Y S. Okay. Uh, and so it's like uh, it's a neat little like artistic game. You're, it's kind of like a steampunky sort of world. You've got like eight divers. They're going into this water, but they're all in a different like level of the sea. And and you need a diver to be at a certain level to do its action. And so like maybe the green guy needs to collect green resources. And so he gets to the place where there's a bunch of green resources and you use them. But then he goes back up to the top of the water and everyone else kind of slides down. So there's this kind of like programming aspect where you might have like, Oh, good, good. Okay, both of these guys are in the right spot. Good. I can use both of their abilities. But you, Okay, I'll use the black guy first, but then the black guy goes to the top, but then he like knocks the blue guy down. And you're like, oh no, 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 I, ne I, I needed him to be at level four. Now he's at level five. What do I do? <laughs> uh, and so then you have to like figure out like how to like, it's kind of like cash car where it's like, you have to get yes. him back up to the top and then figure out how to like bring him back down to okay, the spot okay, where you okay. need him to be. Uh, so it's kind of that same sort of like tension, a little bit of like kind of programming uh, sort of style of game. And there are ways, there's little like technologies you can get. Right. You get a battery pack so you don't have to go up for water as often or whatever. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And uh, you can get little propellers on your on your scuba gear <laughs> to like you know help to move you around or stuff like that. But but yeah, it's just a really interesting game. But like nobody talks. About it. it looks great. Like this has been on my list forever. Hmm. I wanted to pick this up. And so. uh, yeah, no, really like it. But for me, this is the definition of a hidden gem. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> that's awesome. Four, I've talked about it a couple times. This is the Builders Middle Ages. Mm. This is the last ten on my list. <laughs> <laughs> Get rid of those things. So Father Greg and I actually played this after mm -hmm. I talked about it on my Top 100. And uh, it, it's excellent. It got mm -hmm. this really neat uh, kind of worker placement-ish thing going on. Where mm -hmm. on your turn you can just pull uh, a building that you would like to construct into your tableau. You can pull some workers into your tableau for free. But then it starts to cost you to actually use your workers onto the construction sites. And the construction sites have resources that they're looking for in the listing on the side of the card. Then the workers have resources that they provide and they're listed on the side of the card and you kind of match them up. But every worker that you use on the same turn is additional money. Right. So like first worker is one coin to place, the next worker is two coins to place, the next worker is three coins to place. So if I want to use three workers on a building in the same turn, that's six coins. And money doesn't come easy in mm -hmm. this game. But th this is nice. It's just a race to a certain amount of cash. Right. And uh, when you build certain buildings, they have a payout. and it, It's just fun. Mm -hmm. it's just boom. Get her done. Uh, my number three, I talked about uh, not that long ago. I think it was in our best plays of the month or whatever. Uh, so this comes in at 2367. So if you thought the top 1,000 was around, this is another 1,000 and more below that. Uh, and this is Limes or Limeys. Mm. Uh, so, uh, which is funny because there was a game, uh, another game that was just below the, uh, the top 1,000, which is called Honshu. Which I think okay. this game is kind of like you're you're putting cards down and the cards have little terrains and you're kind of trying yeah. to create groups of terrains. But I vastly prefer this to Honshu. Okay. Uh, even though I enjoy Honshu as well, but like to me, these two orders should be flipped. Like this lime should be at a thousand, Honshu should be at twenty three hundred or whatever. Okay. Um, Get on down, uh, Honshu. <laughs> that's right. It's we like, don't want you here. I don't know why. Anyways, but uh, but yeah, no, it's just it's a really it's yeah it's Karuba meets like King Domino. I think I described it yeah. as. It's you're just putting terrains, drawing a card, putting it, kind of arranging it into like a little four by four grid. Scoring some points for the all different rules. Forests want to be in one group. Uh, your watchtowers want to be able to see a lot of forests. Your lakes want to have a bunch of fishing houses on them. Whatever. But yeah. you, you score points. It's it's a great... It's, it's just a delightful little, uh, little thinky game. That's awesome. That's awesome. Limes. Yeah. And, and it has that Karuba thing where everyone has the same cards. That's right. And one player draws one. Or do they pick one? No, yeah. So everyone, one person draws one and then everyone else searches their deck and finds okay. card number 26 yeah, or whatever. Yeah, yeah, yeah. That's, that's awesome. awesome. Yeah. Okay, so my number three is coming in at 2081. Mm. 2081. So we're in the 2000s now. Yeah. This is Al Gaucho. 
Wow. So this, this was a Z Garcia epiphany that I had. Mm. He, he, he advocated for this game. And this is an amazing little dice drafting worker placement game. So the whole thing that you're trying to do is there's all these cow tiles. And they're numbered like 1 to 10 or something. And there's different, there's white cows, black cows, brown spotted cows, yellow spotted cows, mm -hmm. and all these different cows. And you're putting workers on spaces to get cows into your little tableau. You are uh, drafting dice and you get to drive two dice at a time. And the dice that you draft uh, allow you to do the particular actions that are out on the board. So you need a particular number on your dice to do actions. Dice drafting games mm -hmm. don't come up as often as I would like them to. Right. So this like really landed for me. Like this was like the first dice drafting game I played, and it still kind of holds the spot for like my favorite of mm -hmm. like how it actually utilizes that mechanic. Mm -hmm. So like you know you draft in Ganshan Clever or whatever, but it's not super satisfying how you use. It. Like it's like right. you draft and then you kind of pencil in something. Mm -hmm. Whereas this is like I need to draft those numbers so that I can go to that worker placement space mm -hmm. to do that thing. So that's a really cool combination of the two mechanisms I really enjoy. Right. And then you're just making your rows of cows and how your cow score is the most the that's highest so cow. Weird. <laughs> What? No, 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 go ahead. Describe it. So, I think the first time you described this to me was like, you put your best looking cow on the outside and everyone, nobody looks at the rest of your cows that are complete garbage. That's they right. just see one beautiful cow and they assume that the rest of the nine all got to be like that. That's right. That's right. It's this really weird scoring where your highest numbered cow is going to score for the number of cows of that type in that row. Mm -hmm. So if I have a one, a two, a three, and a four, and a ten... <laughs> that's 10 times 5. That's and right. that's what I'm getting for money when I sell off that badge. <laughs> so it's a really unique way of scoring. And there's an opportunity when one of the worker placement spaces to steal cows from people. So it gets a little mean at that mm -hmm. front. But uh, this is great. I, I, I miss this game. Nice. Good choice. I haven't played El Gaucho in a long time. Right on. Well, uh, I was in the 2000s for a bit, but I'm already in the 3000s now. We're at, <laughs> we're at 3140. And when I saw this game at 3140, oh man, my heart dropped. This is subdivision. This oh, is... Uh, oh, Poor man. baby. I know. Subdivision. <laughs> I mean, I get it. It's not a looker on the outside or on the inside. Like, the outside <laughs> of the box is a bunch of like men standing over some plan on a board being like... And the inside of the box looks like that. <laughs> the inside of the box is like, here's a school. It's brown. Here's a park. It's kind of green. <laughs> it's like, like, the colors are not great. But the like, man, just the puzzly aspect of this game is so interesting. So like, you put a tile down and it does nothing. But then the next time you put a tile down, it does, it activates all the tiles that are around it. Mm. So it's like, you put this tile down and then it activates this forest that's next to it. And the forest does something when it's activated. It gives you like a dollar or something. And then the school does something else. And by the end of it, you've got this nice little city. You, you're trying to connect like roads and make sure they get to all the places so... You know, you have a road that goes to your school, so you don't just, like, get off the road and walk a mile to get to school. Uh, but, you know, like, everything everything just kind of, like, lines up. And, oh, I just love Subdivision. I cannot believe it is below 3,000. I can. <laughs> <laughs> I've never played Subdivision. I don't know. So my second hidden gem on the list. This, this, is, this is my newest, to me, game on this list. Mm. We just played this game together. Okay. This is coming in at 3183. Wow. This is Curse Court. Wow. This is such a neat game. Mm -hmm. This is really cool. They, they, in the board game he comments, they say a lot, like this is kind of Texas Hold'em meets whatever. Mm -hmm. And it's sort of that, like I think that's the best way to describe it when you're trying to introduce the game to people. Mm -hmm. Basically, there's just this board of these nine characters. And you have a deck of cards, and those characters show up four times a piece in this deck of cards. And then however many players there are, you just place a card in between each player, and then you flip up a card face up. And then all over this board are different configurations of these characters on different spaces. And so basically what you're saying is that by the end of this round, when we reveal three more cards, including the cards that are face down now, that these characters are gonna show up in these configurations. Mm -hmm. And so you have a bunch of poker chips that you place out on these different spaces saying, 
I think this is going to happen. And if it happens, you get points according to the configuration. Mm -hmm. So four for a group of four, three for a group of three, and then uh, what? One, two, five, or eight points if right. you go onto a character and their card shows up one, two, three, or four times. Mm -hmm. And in order, you can bump people off of bids, but you have to pay double the poker chips that they put on that mm -hmm. bid. And you have 20 to play with. Not a whole lot going on here in terms of like strategic depth. Sometimes the obvious bid just gets taken mm -hmm. kind of because of the turn order situation. So you can feel a little bit uh, messed over with a little bit there. Mm -hmm. But like quick, fun, and you can you can still be smart about it. Right. You, you, can, you can make safe, deliberate bids. Or you can kind of risk it for the biscuit. Mm -hmm. And uh, pays off just miraculously. Yeah, it's cool. And sometimes you just bet on something... Because there's some information that you don't know and some information that like hasn't even been, isn't even known to anyone yet. It hasn't right. even shown up. And so sometimes you might just bet on like, well, I'll hope that the jester shows up. But other people like see that bet and they're like, well, he must have the jester. For sure he's got the jester. So he's not like betting, putting all their money on the jester. And you're yes. like, uh, all right, I just was like hoping he'd show up. But you <laughs> seem really convinced. So maybe we both got jesters. Maybe I'm going to put all my money yeah, on the jester. Yeah, 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 yeah. <laughs> and then like no jester shows up. And everyone's like, just like, what the hell? <laughs> yeah. Um, but yeah, so yeah, really interesting kind of bidding. Yeah. Uh, kind of bluffing game. I, I think it's a really nice design. Cool. So there you go. Okay, what what's, what's your most hidden... Jim, my most underrated board game. Yeah, this one also kind of surprised me. I think that it was my most underrated, but it's coming in at three thousand two hundred and forty-six, uh, and that is a game called Vengeance. Uh, Whoa! So Vengeance is a big game. I'll like say a lot of these boxes are like smaller, kind of lighter games. This is not. This is a game that takes me two hours, two full hours, maybe three, to okay. like play, especially if you have multiple players. Um, but it's like, if you, if you've ever watched like Kill Bill or any kind of weird, like, you know, vengeance movies, John Wick. Yeah, you know. exactly. Those kind of things. Like, and it goes through the whole movie. Like you you start out with a character, they're taken hostage by some gang. They're like, their fingers cut off. They're electrocuted. They're like, whatever, all this horrible stuff happens to them. And so now they want to kill all those gang members. Like they want to finally murder the boss. And so like you go through a montage scene where like the eighties music plays and, <laughs> and they start like punching the bag and like building up skills. And then finally you like, you find out where they're hiding. They're all in this little den and you have like three dice rolls to like run in and kill everyone. And, uh, it just gives you that really satisfying experience like sometimes games try to make you feel powerful yeah. but then like it's a lot of work to kill one guy but here you could like you just roll the dice you're like boom three guys are dead sweet <laughs> onto the next room like and you just kick it down doors you're like throwing knives at people so it it's, really has that kinetic feel mm -hmm. like, you know, that, man like th this sounds really neat and so yeah you just have to like get into the room like murder everyone get out like you have three dice rolls to do it it's it's like it's it's a lot of build up for like this very quick like, you spend, like, an hour building up for this moment. Uh, and you do that kind of, like, three times. But, okay. um, but yeah, and then you get points if you... For, like, the different bosses that you kill. Because there's different clans. I may be impartial to this because there's a, there's a priest character. <laughs> priest who's, like, <laughs> taking part of, like, from these, like, Colombian <laughs> drug lords. And, and he's got, like, a wine bottle in one hand and a pistol in the other. And it's, like, the miniature is great. He just, like, runs around, like... Wreaking vengeance. It's just fantastic. Well, I mean, that's my experience of you on a regular basis. So, I mean, I guess. This is great. I love vengeance. That's awesome. Oh, man. Okay, the last game we're going to talk about, the most underrated game. We're going into the 6,000s, baby. Wow. We are 6,187. This is on my list for a reason, party people. This game is good, and you can't tell me any different. <laughs> This is Atelier, the painter. Oh studio. my gosh! No! No! Oh! Oh no! This yes. game is garbage. Yes. No, it is not garbage. <laughs> don't don't take their minds. Uh. This is. I, I did think I should have put like a warning. On this. <laughs> I do think this is a hidden gem. Mm -hmm. It's very hidden. <laughs> but here here's the deal with Atelier, the painter studio. It has. Um, a really great kind of core idea going on where you, you're basically there's a whole bunch of paintings available mm -hmm. and they require certain paints to paint them mm -hmm. and then there's the pools of these paints there's four different colors of paints and there's little cylinder wooden tokens 
and then you have your painters. And it's this little area control situation where you put your painters next to these piles of the different paints. And if you have the majority of your painters uh, next to that color paint, when you do the collect paints action, you're able to collect that color paint. Mm -hmm. And so when you collect paints, you're not just guaranteed to collect all the paints, you're only gonna collect what you have going for it. Now I'd say that this plays best at three, and so this, this is my caveat, this, this is a hidden gem if you play it at three. Or is it four? Anyway, this is a hidden gem at one number. <laughs> but there's one number of players where uh, you get the paints if you're tied. Mm. When you have to have the majority, it gets a little bit sticky. Mm. But when you can get your paints when it's tied, it's a little more free and, and a, little, a little easier on people to play. Mm. But basically what you're doing is it's kind of one of those Yahtzee style dice rolling things. But what I really like about it is you roll your dice, you do as many actions as you want, and then you keep whatever dice you don't want to use, and then you roll them the next round or next turn, mm -hmm. and you kind of go again. And so if you don't get what you want, you still kind of have a chance to get what you want. The main complaint is that it's dice, and doing what you want to do sometimes just doesn't happen. Mm -hmm. But everybody's at that same... I'm, yeah. I'm, I'm, yeah, yeah. I'm already feeling gotcha. defensive about this no, no, game. I gotcha. <laughs> so this is my hidden gem that does come with caveats. All the other games on my list, I would say, great. Like, if you like the style of game that we were talking about, you can't really go wrong. Mm -hmm. Th this, you're going to have to take a little bit of like, for some reason, Daniel likes this. <laughs> and I might like it too. Mm -hmm. Because this is, uh, I don't know. For me, when I sit down and I play it, I just have fun. Mm -hmm. I just have fun. And you can't take that away from me. Right. Don't do it. We, we, but, should, we should play it. But I, we should I, play it right now. I, I did enjoy I did enjoy it. <laughs> yes, he admits it. He enjoyed it. Yes. Well, okay, party people, there we have it. Those are our top 10 underrated board games. Our top 10 hidden gems. Let us know down below what your hidden gem games of choice are. I hope you enjoyed this list. If you like this video, please give it a like. I hear it helps. Please subscribe to the channel. That is awesome for us. And if you like these videos, watch more of them and stay tuned because we're just going to make more videos. We're about once a week. We just kind of pop onto your YouTube feed. We say hi and we appreciate you. So party people, keep on talking to us down below. We love you dearly. And until next time, have the best day. <laughs>